Hello, Facebook community. Good morning. I'm Angel Ellers, one of the environmental educators with the Greenbelt in New York City Parks. Welcome to another one of our very exciting and educational and fun Greenbelt at Home programs. We're so happy to be able to offer these virtual programs to you in the comfort of your own home or your own phone, wherever you may be. Today, we are doing a Scenic Perspectives virtual hike. We do this on a bi-monthly basis. And we like to focus on kind of the social history and the natural history of particular trails throughout the Greenbelt. And today, myself and my co-educator and friend, Christopher Ricker, will be visiting the Pink Trail. And maybe not many of you have visited the Pink Trail of the Greenbelt, but we're going to show you a little bit of what you might find out here today. And it's a really beautiful day. Lots of this snow is melting. We may have to trudge through a little bit of mud, but that's quite all right. I'm going to switch the camera around so you can see what I'm seeing. So the pink trail, as you can see, um, the beginning of which is right here, marked on this first tree by this pink pyramid of trailblazes. Um, that is the international marker of the beginning of a trail. So we know that's where it begins. And you will find actually on the other side of that tree, the upside down pyramid that is the mark of the end of a trail. And this is located in the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge and Preserve. You can see along the trail, there are some more pink markers showing you that that is where the trail goes through the woods. But I want to show you actually what I'm walking on, which is a really, really cool feature of the Greenbelt and some other jurisdictions that surround the Greenbelt. I love to talk about how people can find their, themselves at the trails where we are. And this one's actually super accessible to lots of people, depending on how you travel to and from the green belt. If you're like myself, pregnant, pregnant during pandemic winter, you're going to be driving. That's what I did today. I drove here and we're located right near the old Barnes and Noble at Travis and Richmond Avenue. There's parking along the streets. But if you don't drive and you take public transportation, worry not. There is public transportation available from the ferry, taking the S44, going toward the mall. And you can also access this point by going to, by taking the S59. In addition to the bike, the bus, and driving, you can walk like this gentleman is doing down this bike trail. But you'll also notice that this is a bike trail, which is really cool. I'm going to swing around so you can see if any of you um, bicycling enthusiasts who love to use the multi-purpose trail throughout the Greenbelt, you probably know that this trail is called the New Springville Greenway. You can see that even the turkey vultures like to soar above the Greenway. So the Greenway is really great. It's another multi-purpose trail, um, really giving some right of way to bicyclists because they don't have too many places to travel throughout the island. But the multi-purpose trail from the Greenbelt can be picked up at Forest Hill Road and Rockland Avenue. It's a really beautiful gravel trail that you'll find lots of people in the neighborhood frequenting. But as you see, I am walking toward our guide for the day, environmental educator Christopher Ricker. He's going to take us just beyond this no bicycling sign, making it clear that bicycles stop on the pavement. And then there is the bicycle rack where you can um, chain up your ride so you can go for a walk. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, Angel. Hey, everyone at home. Hope you're all doing well. As Angel said, we are joined here today for another scenic perspective with Three Belt at Home. So we're just going to step over this little snow bluff to get onto the trail. 
such a beautiful day. Oh, I love it. So Angel and I were just here yesterday, right? I think it was the day before. The day before yesterday, and this entire place was covered in snow. So we were probably in like four inches of snow. And so just in two days, you can see how nice the weather's gotten that all that snow melt is kind of dissipated back into the earth. So I'm sure Angel mentioned that today we are at the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge, which is uh, a part of the Greenbelt that borders fresh hills. And if the name William T. Davis sounds familiar to you, that is because William T. Davis uh, is a renowned Staten Island naturalist who helped to co-found the uh, Natural Science Association on Staten Island. He's well known for his uh, interest and in study as an amateur entomologist, where he was the, the leading expert on the periodic periodical cicada, as well as has done a lot of work in just exploring all of Staten Island's natural wonders uh, for a really long period of time, for something like 50 years. And A Day of Field, A Days of Field in Staten Island is an amazing book that's worth checking out. And at the Staten Island Museum in Snug Harbor, the archives actually have all of his journals. So if you're ever interested in checking out that information, there's some really great exhibits at the Staten Island Museum related to William T. Davis. And so his legacy lives on here in the Greenbelt. And he's an inspiration for all of us to continue to come out, explore, because even as an amateur entomologist, ornithologist, botanist, um, he has a legacy on Staten Island, and so can you. So just follow your passions and your interests and your path in the outdoors. Can you tell us real quick what an entomologist is? Yes, so an entomologist is an individual who studies invertebrates, generally uh, insects and arachnids. And then there's all kinds of sub uh, categories of that. So maybe you're an arachnologist because you're studying spiders. Maybe you're a aquatic macrobiologist. Would you consider yourself an entomologist? I would consider myself an amateur entomologist. Nice. And an amateur arachnologist because I really, really dig spiders. I'm sure a lot of people out there can relate to really, really digging spiders. I remember yesterday or the other day when we were here and there was so much more snow that we could see down this animal trail that I can still see some of the leaves batted down, but we could see lots and lots of different animal tracks like it was a little highway out there. It's amazing how things change in such a short period of time. Right. And just like if you followed Angel and I's Winter Animal Tracks program that's still on our newsfeed somewhere that you can find and refer back to, or on our YouTube channel, mm -hmm. um, there's still plenty of mud, so we might be able to see some cool tracks, even though, like Angel mentioned, that snow dissipated. Snow is a really fun substrate to observe tracks through because once it snows, it usually doesn't leave until it melts. And then you can actually study the aging of tracks because the track may still be there from a few weeks ago. And you can see how over time it changes and grows and starts to look like other tracks. It's pretty amazing. So something I found cool, and I'm sure Angel might have mentioned it earlier, is like we can still hear all that traffic. So that neighborhood that's currently known as Travis, has always played a big role in this specific park area. Because even though we're in a wildlife refuge, we're really close to a neighborhood. And this neighborhood's interesting because it has a lot of pretty cool history, just like a lot of Staten Island neighborhoods. So I mentioned this is called Travis now, but does anybody know what it was originally called? So, there's a lot of guesses we could probably take. You know, it's in the area of Bull's Head. But this was originally called Linoleumville. <laughs> so linoleum, like that really um, that rolled out material that we used to put on a lot of kitchens, 
Some people might still have linoleum. Um, this area actually had the first linoleum factory in the United States. So this was all called Linoleumville, which kind of sounds like a fake name. Like you might hear that in like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or something. But it was definitely called that. And then its name was changed to Travisville, and eventually Travis. And Travisville was named after Colonel Jacob Travis, who lived in the neighborhood prior to the Civil War. So for any of those history buffs out there, it's a little Staten Island nugget of historical love. There's a really beautiful, gentle rustling of the dried phragmite leaves. Very common sound in this area and around uh, wetlands and marshes of Staten Island. Chris did say that Brush Kills Park is right next to the wildlife refuge where we are. And at certain points in the walk, you may be on a higher elevation where you can actually see the hills of what will be one of the largest New York City parks come 2036 when it is fully open to the public. Just beyond these trees, you can see some of the snow still on the mounds there. And we are, oops, go ahead. I was going to say, I can't visually see the birds, but I can hear them. And I believe there's something like 116 uh, different species of birds that are documented here. Sometimes those are migratory birds. Uh, sometimes those are year-round birds that call Staten Island home. And what's really cool is, again, this park was originally designated, I believe, in 1928 as a wildlife refuge. So William T. Davis and the Audubon Society came together to protect 52 acres of land. So since that time, this section of the Greenbelt has expanded over the years. Uh, and eventually now it's around 300 plus acres, give or take with fresh killed borders, uh, making it something like the sixth largest New York City park. Wow, that's amazing. another one of those historical nuggets that I think is kind of cool is further on down the line of the acquisition of some of this land was procuring some of the land from what was then the Crystal Water Bottling Company, which was bottling just fresh spring water from Staten Island and selling it. Um, of course, at this point, the water that flows through here is no longer potable, so please do not drink it. But it is really awesome to think about the history of this land and this space before now. A more of a personal story in history I had grown up five minutes from here, just up Rockland Avenue in the Saxon Homes apartment complex. Um, so this was a place that I was always walked to as a child to explore. Um, so early on, I just have a pretty strong connection to this place. And then at the age of 16, um, after being kind of a, a truant, not great high school student, um, because I preferred being outside to in the classroom, I began to volunteer at the United for Wildlife Wildlife Refuge, which 
Uh, the building itself that used to house that wildlife rehabilitation center for injured and sick wildlife is behind us at the corner of Richmond Avenue and Travis. And so at the time, um, Bob Zink was the executive director and he knew that New York City needed a wildlife re rehabilitation center. And so the borough commissioner of parks, Thomas Paulo at the time, um, basically just gave the entire parks building to this nonprofit um, with the mission of protecting and rehabilitating New York City's uh, wildlife when they get injured or sick. And I believe the first injured deer on Staten Island, and it might have been the first deer that we re-saw on Staten Island in the late 90s, early 2000s, was rehabilitated there. So you imagine at the time, a lot of resources went into protecting and rehabbing that one deer, and now we have something like 5,000 on Staten Island. Yeah, the first of many, huh? It must have been amazing to be able to actually work in that space and with the animals there. And I know that that is part of your history here with the Greenbelt, that your time here started before you were a Greenbelt educator. And even from the time that you were a kid walking these trails, that's really beautiful. And little would you think that this land just to the left of us, that was at one point one of the largest landfills in the world, would actually be well on its way to a thriving ecosystem, providing lots of space and habitat for the various wildlife species on Staten Island that are really trying to cling to some natural green spaces at this point. And speaking of which, we are around the area of, um, the ecosystem is generally speaking a salt marsh around the edges of Staten Island in these kind of areas that are tributaries of the rivers. So where we are is along the two heads of the, uh, the two tributaries of the Fresh Kills Creek. So it's Main Creek and Springville Creek and salt marshes are really important to ecosystems, especially to lands like Staten Island. Um, they actually provide a natural water filtration system for making sure that whatever toxins may be in the land don't end up seeping out into the ocean and contaminating any farther than the land. And that may sound like kind of a weird place to really find some happy refuge, but different um, species like cordgrass are really hardy and really perfectly adapted for growing out there and being kind of the pioneer species that grow in the mud. And then other animals come in like mussels and fiddler crabs that kind of thrive on all of the debris around the cord grasses, And then they die off and they leave their debris to grow peat on top of the marsh, adding layers to it and adding more space for more wildlife to grow and to thrive. Which is especially interesting and important, um, the water filtration aspect it's really important to this neighborhood and any neighborhood that is nearby a wetland like this because it actually provides um, stormwater management as well. So if there are really big waves coming in from some sort of big storm, then the, um, the salt marsh can actually act as a buffer to protect from storm surges and things like that. And then of course, considering the history of fresh kills in this general area, keeping contaminants from going out to sea is always a great idea and something worth working hard to preserve because these areas are very fragile and being filled in every year in New York City to um, constru make constructions on top of. So it's a very important space. Very happy that this is a forever wild space that will not be built upon, but will be preserved for all time. <laughs> So 
Deja, it made me think of something when you were talking about some of the native grass and frog grass, because when I'm looking out there right now, I see a lot of Phragmites, which is that invasive reed. Absolutely. That is taken over. And so I don't personally know, but maybe you have an idea. How do you think that might affect some of those native frog grasses that um, help to equalize our wetlands and create that peat habitat? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And that's what I was wondering also as I was reading up on this. And the answer is kind of similar to how invasive species interact in native environments in general. So what happens with these Phragmites is, yeah, you might think that they're actually serving the same purpose as the cord grass and as they die off and add their layers of peat that they're still doing something positive. But what it seems is that since they are the more aggressive species, they take over the natural habitat of the cord grass and then they actually don't contribute such nutritious output to the salt marsh. So they're still contributing and they're still adding peat and they're still providing habitat and making that mud that the other species feed on and aerate and all of that. But um, it's just kind of like a junk food, basically. It's not adding anything well, not adding as much of substance, unfortunately. And they are incredibly difficult to control. So that's kind of where we are. And I'm sure everybody out there who's seen our marshes along the uh, shores, mostly the Western shores of Staten Island, are very familiar with this tall, feathery, limber kind of plant known as the common reed or the Phragmites. And I know the Fresh Kills Alliance and Fresh Kills Park, when they're running their public programs again, uh, they do a lot of outreach program related to utilizing Phragmites and recycling it into paper. Um, so if you check out their website, the Fresh Kills Alliance, you might see some potential virtual or future public program that they offer. The Fresh Kills Discovery Days are really awesome too. So those happen maybe like twice a year. So if you want to get to explore fresh kills and that landmass right over there, um, as it begins to open up slowly and become that largest park, like Asia mentioned, those are really great opportunities and resources for us and you all at home. Ooh, look what we have here, really close to the trail. It's amazing that they were just underneath the snow, waiting to pop up. Does anybody out there know what we're looking at? These kind of spooky looking dinosaur-like plant materials. They're pretty cool. They're kind of maroon and green and they're growing all over this very moist wetland. Um, Chris, what are they? What are they? What hmm. are they? So, I think that they might be skunk cabbage. And maybe some of you have seen on other videos when they first start protruding out, like the angel mentioned, they look like this alien pod from like the Body Snatchers. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but as they grow, they bloom out into these big cabbage-like leafy greens that smell a lot like skunk. And although humans may be like, eh, that's kind of stinky. I'd never put that near my mouth. A lot of flies and um, non-bee pollinators love the stinky stuff. So they have very specific niches that they fill by being stinky. I don't know if you can see, there's some ones up over there. Mm -hmm. Up the stream a little bit, protruding. And they look pretty small and unassuming now, but come spring, the skunk cabbage, they open their leaves and they look quite a bit like open cabbages. And they are so vibrant and green and so beautiful. Something really great about this trail that I'm appreciating as we're walking here is what I'm focusing on right now 
and these um, raised duck walks because like we've said, this is a very moist environment. Sometimes can be very difficult to hike through unless you have mucklucks or some sort of boot. But today I'm really, really appreciating something to walk on. And this trail is only about 0.5 to 0.75 miles long, very short. And one of the actual like easy trails, some of our trails will start out easy and end up being kind of moderate difficult at points where you didn't expect it. But this one is very reliably a nice easy trail to walk. And if you come out here, definitely remember to bring your binoculars. You may be able to catch some really great sights of some of the 116 species of birds. I know we saw at least four out here today and we'd see a lot more if we hung out. So I'm going to follow the sound of water as I love to do, see where it leads us. I'm always drawn to the flowing water on Staten Island. Really reminds me of the fact that we are the borough of parks and we have so much to offer people, especially during these times. And this day is making me so happy because I know so many people were probably stuck inside all winter and not able to come out to the trails and feeling kind of cooped up. So I'm excited for people to be able to come out and experience all of the benefits of walking through our parks. So before we tread out of here, we did find some footprints. So I'll get my shadow out of the way. And so you can see that there's two little, like a cloven hook there and one behind it. And so it was almost like the deer skirted the snow just to make sure that they <laughs> were walking on the soft substrate. Yeah, and when we were out here the other day, we noticed that the deer had walked on the duck walks like the humans do. So they took advantage of the um, lack of super deep snow as well. I'm sure you notice, in addition to the sound of serene flowing water, we are also hearing sounds of trucks and passing traffic a little louder because we are heading back toward the beginning of the trail. This is a nice circle trail, but we are going to probably cut it short now because I want to follow the water and I want to also see down at that viewing area if we can see anything over the Phragmites. Awesome. Cool. So thank you all for joining us for yet another Greenbelt at Home virtual hike, Scenic Perspectives. If you're interested in more of our Greenbelt education programs and the Greenbelt Conservancy, you can check out our website at sigreenbelt.org. We also have a YouTube channel, the Staten Island Greenbelt, and social media platforms, just like we're on today. So we can't wait to see you again virtually or on the trails. Have a great one. Have a great day, everyone.